Absolutely. Good morning, everybody. This is Jens Chapman at SSF, and on behalf of all of our team members here, we welcome you into the new year and to our first virtual Spine Journal Club of the year. And we're really happy to have a newcomer to the fold from the University of Missouri, the Department of Neurosurgery, Dr. Siddiq and his team. And they're going to talk about something that is a rising, increasing problem in many regards. It's cervical spondylotic myelopathy and uh, all the permutations, missed opportunities, and the non-surgical and surgical treatment decision-making uh, and management options. And there's a lot to talk about, so I'm going to pass off the microphone to my colleagues in Missouri. This is a great topic, and we're really looking forward uh, to hearing from you. And I also want to Welcome our uh, friends at TBI. Uh, I see uh, Dr. Geyer there. Good morning. And Dr. Blumenthal. Good morning. Sorry. Good morning to Dallas, Texas, and to all of our online community. Without much further ado, uh, Dr. Siddiq, take it over. Hi. Uh, thank you. This is uh, Farhan Siddiq. I'm uh, um here from uh, University of Missouri uh, Department of Neurosurgery. Um, uh, I have my uh, colleague, three residents here, uh, Dr. Ravi uh, Luna, um, uh, Michael Ortiz, and uh, Joseph Herbert. And uh, like you said, uh, the, we ha thank you, first of all, for uh, allowing us with this uh, opportunity. Um, cervical myelopathy is, uh, is a, a very challenging uh, uh, disease and uh, decision-making processes. And as we all know, there's a lot of controversy uh, about, uh, you know, first of all, uh, what's the optimal timing for surgery? What are the outcomes of surgery? Um, and then uh, the surgical options, both front and back uh, um, or 360. So we always debate about this, uh, you know, in our, in our uh, uh, groups and uh, short, small discussions, big discussions, national meetings, uh, doesn't seem like anybody uh, or any one particular group have the recipe for success here. Uh, so I think uh, the idea for this journal club was to just collect some of the um, um, articles that have uh, um, information about um, um, uh, the surgical treatments of um, uh, cervical myelopathy, uh, and then maybe gain some in, um, knowledge and experience from that. And at the same time, critically appraise those articles and see where they stand as, uh, as part of level of evidence that we have for this uh, uh, particular medical problem. All right. Great. Um, I will kick us off here. Um, let's put this PowerPoint. You guys able to see my screen? Is that working? Okay, great. So um, our first article is an article out of the Red Journal in 2019. It's efficacy and safety of surgery for mild degenerative cervical myelopathy, um, results of the AO Spine North America and International Perspective Multicenter Studies. This was published in the Red Journal in 2019. Uh, it's most up-to-date impact factor is 5.3. It's gone up in the last couple of years. The study type is a pooled subgroup analysis of prospective multi-center trials. And the authors, all the authors are from the University of Toronto, the Division of Neurosurgery. And um, this study was um, by Dr. Failings and his, um, and his entire group. The overall objective of the study was to evaluate both baseline and long-term post-operative outcomes of functional status, disability and quality of life in patients with mild degenerative cervical myelopathy. The outcome measures, the primary outcome measures of this study were, there was multiple. They used the functional status, which was defined by the modified Japanese orthopedic association score or MJOA score, the NURIC grade. Um, for disability, they used the neck disability index, the NDI and functional status. They use many different variables in short form 36, the second version. And these are all um, outcome measures that we're all um, fairly uh, familiar with at this point. In regards to the inclusion criteria, this study focused on mild uh, degenerative cervical myelopathy. They defined mild as an MJOA score of 15 to 17, which you can see pictured here on the right. Um, that, that's not too much lower than actually the maximum score. So um, people with a 15 to 17 would only be missing a couple points. So their symptoms would truly um, be rather mild. Um, other inclusion criteria in the entire uh, population that was collected in these trials was uh, patients had to be 18 years or older, 
that had to have symptomatic myelopathy with at least one clinical sign of myelopathy, uh, clear imaging evidence of cervical cord compression, and also notably no prior cervical spine uh, surgery. So all patients in this, uh, in this trial um, have never had any kind of neck surgery previously. Data collection occurred over a five-year period and they collected 193 patients um, collected between these two prospective multicenter trials. Um, the first one was the AO spine uh, CSM-NA that was one Canadian and 11 American sites from 2005 to 2007. And then the larger one was AO spine CSM-1 that was six Asian, five European, three Latin American, two North American sites between 2007 and 2011. So um, clearly it's a well-represented population and it's an international multi-center cohort. Uh, surgical technique, all patients underwent decompression of the cer cervical spine with or without instrumented fusion. For an anterior approach, they did either a discectomy or a corpectomy with fusion. Uh, the posterior approach um, was used with a laminectomy with or without fusion or a laminoplasty. And then some people also required a front back or a circumferential approach. Um, notably, cervical, surgical approach levels and the use of instrumentation were at the discretion of the treating spine surgeon. Um, this is just baseline characteristics. Um, I thought that the only um, real interesting things here was that um, the population was fairly well represented in terms of their level of disability. And you can see that with the um, MJOA scores 15, 16, and 17, with um, it being pretty well balanced with most patients being 15, some at 16, and some at 17. And then uh, you can also notice the NURIC rates, the maximum NURIC score was a three, which would be defined as a mild gait impairment. So no, nobody was a four or five. And then you can see the, um, the baseline NDI and short form um, outcome parameters here. Presenting symptoms, I thought, I thought that one um, interesting thing that this um, study gave us is uh, perspective information regarding um, presenting signs and symptoms and also complications, which um, a lot of our data is retrospective or historical in nature. So at least out of these 193 patients, the most common symptom was numb hands, uh, followed by clumsy hands and gait difficulty. And in terms of signs, uh, the most common was actually uh, hyperreflexia and uh, positive Hoffman sign, followed by corticospinal distribution motor deficits, atrophy of the um, hand intrinsic muscles, and a couple other signs on physical examination. Uh, in terms of operative management, um, it was not a uh, balance between anterior and posterior, uh, at least in for these set of spine surgeons, there was um, a clear favoring of the anterior approach. Almost 75% of surgeries were in the anterior approach. Um, another interesting point was it seems that uh, in, with the inclusion of all the posterior surgeries, they did end at C7, which I thought was interesting. I know there's some argument there. Now, in terms of the main outcome measures, you, this is really the meat of the entire paper. And they looked at a couple different things. and. Um, the most important things that they wanted to look at are both the preoperative status of the patients, but then also they, they followed the patients at six months, 12 months, 24 months, and then they calculated the difference um, the, between the preoperative and the results at two years. So that's the primary outcome measure is the difference between the preoperative and two-year outcome measures. Um, there was no difference in the 30-meter walk test, but besides that, all other um, outcome measures did have a significant difference, both in the MJO, MJOA, the NURIC, um, most of the um, components of the short form, uh, most notably the physical component summary and the mental component summary, um, and then also the NDI, and then also the overall short form 6D. Now, they don't have any probability measures here, but they do have p-values. And what they also include in the discussion, um, helpfully, are the minimum clinically important differences that are necessary for each of these outcome parameters. So um, for the short form 6D, the minimal, minimum clinical important difference is 0 0.03. So they reported almost a fourfold increase in that um, clinically important difference. In terms of the uh, physical component summary, they reported 5.75, which is over the um, uh, MCID of five points. For the mental component summary, they also reported 6.93, again, greater than the MCID of five points. And for the NDI, again, nearly 13, which is um, nearly double the uh, MCID of 7.5 points. So overall, um, clearly they have uh, been able to show um, progressive improvements um, in this patient population. One other thing that I just want to point out really quickly that I thought was interesting was that 
Um, anecdotally, it appeared that 80 to 90% of these benefits were um, demonstrated in these patients by the six month mark. If you look at each one of these parameters, most of the improvement was by the six month mark. And then between six and 24 months, there did seem to be some improvement, but it was mild. Um, you know, the vast majority of improvements was, was, in, was within the first six months. And um, I suspected that was, you know, from decompression. Now, they also um, helpfully included complications, and they reported that um, 30, almost 31% of patients had either one or greater complications. Uh, and then beyond that, the, uh, the greatest risk was progression of myelopathy at 6.7%, and then worsening of neck pain of 6%. And I think that this is also a critically important table just because it gives us really, really good information to counsel patients about risk, because this is data from a very large multi-center perspective trial. So it, it can be very helpful um, with counseling conversations. Overall, the, the primary limitations of this study, uh, it's fairly obvious that you know, there's no non-surgical control group. Uh, the authors noted that there was a concern over the ethical implications of denying treatment to symptomatic patients who are at risk of progressive neurologic deterioration. Um, in addition, there was no standardized surgical ma management. So um, it was left to surgical preference, whether they wanted to go anterior, posterior, how many levels, what kind of decompression, and all these um, small nuances was left to the care of the surgeons. Um, overall, um, as a summary, historically, the primary goal of treatment for cervical myelopathy has been the halting of further neurologic deterioration. And I think anecdotally, you know, being a resident, that's something that we're taught every day that, you know, when we're counseling patients, we have to be rather clear that the primary objective is that we want to prevent further neurologic deterioration and any improvements would kind of be an added bonus, but not really guaranteed. And beyond this, the treatment of the surgical management of mild cervical myelopathy has also been controversial because uh, many arguments say that if these patients have mild symptoms, um, do we really know the natural course of the disease and are we really helping these people with decompression um, and potentially fusion as well. Now, I think that this trial hasn't really answered the question um, regarding the natural history of this disease process in mild cervical myelopathy. However, the results of this prospective multicenter pooled analysis suggest that mild cervical myelopathy may be associated with um, significant Im impairments in functional status, disability, and quality of life. And in addition to that, the, the surgical treatment of that may not only uh, limit further neurologic deterioration, but it may have demonstrable improvements in all of these um, outcome parameters. That's, that's all I have for you guys. All right, that's really nice, Ravi. Uh, does anybody have any questions here or we can move to the next one and then we can address questions at the end. Um, this is Jens from Seattle. So thank you uh, for this nice presentation and great summary of a controversial subject. You hit it on the head. Um, the controversy remains that we don't really know what mild myelopathy means for patients. We don't want to overoperate. We want to balance risks and benefits. And uh, this is a very valuable contribution in this regard. I'm still not sure that we have the right metrics to express what we're trying to do with these surgeries. Sometimes it's driven by patient anxiety. Sometimes it's our own anxiety. Um, I hope it's not any other motivations such as keeping the surgical schedule full, but it's, it's definitely a uh, interesting issue because as I looked at outcome scores, for instance, and even functional tests, which this um, paper delves into, I think we lack the tools to express what's actually going on with these patients. Uh, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, what are the optimum outcome scores that we should detect? And are there any desirable functional tests that are objective that we can use or that we should look at in the future? Well, so I think, so you're right. I think, uh, you know, there is a lot of um, controversy about mild uh, cervical myelopathy and uh, uh, part of, the biggest part of the problem is we don't actually know the natural history. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if there will ever be a point in, in our um, lifetime where we would have uh, a purest scientific experiment into natural history of this disease process. Uh, and part of the reason, uh, obviously, is that uh, it's a slow, pro slowly progressive problem. Um, I think what this article brings about is, uh, 
a little bit more comprehensive overview of what, what we're dealing with. And uh, to me, the, some of the most important things in this article were uh, the detail that they went into presenting symptoms, because this is something that we argue a lot um, all the time. What is actually a mild uh, uh, myelopathy and what actually is myelopathy? Because uh, traditionally, we're all told that, you know, if the patient doesn't have, is not hyperreflexic or if they don't have clonus, they don't have myelopathy. But that's not always true because in their in their cohort, uh, very few people had, uh, or 60% had positive Hoffman sign and upgoing toe was only 24%. Uh, uh, and then they have, uh, you know, the, this kind of the standard um, SF36 uh, um, battery, the neuric grade and uh, um, uh, the neck disability ind indices and some of the other um, physical um, uh, batteries and mental um, emotional well-being testing. But you're right, they're not uh, the best tests. And unfortunately, you know, I, I deal a lot with the um, stroke population and functional outcome with the stroke population. And all we have there also is a modified Rankin scale, which is a very large and gross uh, uh, functional scale. Um, so I, I quite honestly at this point don't know what exactly uh, would be a great... Um, functional outcome measure that, that could be employed for these patients uh, uh, that would give us more information about whether we're making an impact by operating early. Um, uh, perhaps um, uh, ability to go back to, um, to work would be a reasonable um, parameter, but again, we know a lot of these people, they, you know, that that's also a variable thing and it's not uniformly, uniformly applicable to every uh, um, patient. Um, Scott Blumenthal, TBI. <laughs> The other point to discuss is you know, in, in the paper that you just discussed, the most common um, signs were uh, Hoffman's and hyperreflexia. And I don't know how many patients come to see me for Hoffman's or hyperreflexia. These patients are coming for the most part because their neck hurts. And then you happen to find these other findings and say, well, now I've got a reason that I can perhaps indicate you for surgery. And hopefully you help their neck pain as well, because that's really what the patients are coming for. And to try to, to try to, to talk about metrics of myelopathy would, would be in a pure sense, if that's, if they weren't ha having neck pain, if they were just having the different grades of myelopathy, but the, unfortunately the bias, you want to treat your patients because they're coming to see you for a symptom that, that does, you know, get in the way of function, bad neck pain. But, you know, how many of us treat just neck pain unless they've got a couple other findings that go along with it. And then your primary outcome is not the, the resolution or improvement of myelopathy. It's, is your patient happy because their function improved because their neck hurts less? Yes, and you have Jens, you have something wise to say after that? It's a great point because again, um, we have to differentiate between incidental um, findings and then neck pain or back pain caused by stenosis. I'm going to venture um, out on a far limb to say that there are different types of neck pain and different types of back pain and stenosis can cause neck pain, it can cause back pain in the lumbar spine and yes it can cause headaches. It's a brilliant observation and again this uh, puts the onus on us to try to differentiate what patients are actually troubled by and what troubles us more than patients. And again, we have quite frequently in our deformity practice, patients who have abnormal reflexes, long track signs, they have no neck pain and we're getting neck imaging, dutiful that we are and we see something that we don't like. And then the discussions get really interesting because they came for something totally different. But my, my summary point is that we don't have really good observation criteria. Uh, I think that a lot of myelopathy is missed uh, pretty badly, even more advanced stages in the higher grade neurics. And what we do with the light neuric grades is very difficult and highly individually different um, in terms of um, assessment of gravity of risk. So I thank you for bringing that up. And I just have to add neck pain can be a manifestation just like headaches of significant cervical stenosis. But Jens, I've, I've noted that's not only missed by clinicians, it's, it's missed by patients. Because sometimes, you know, you'll have some, uh, you'll see somebody walking down the hall with a spastic gait and you go in and you say, how long have you been walking like that? And they go like, what? You know, the, it, it happens so insidiously that the uh, patients, that's not even a big part of their complaint. But um, a lot of times the hand numbness um, or, or dropping 
uh, coffee cups or pens uh, is often a presenting complaint. So, um, you know, I think for me, that's what's brought more people in than neck pain and surprisingly uh, gait and sometimes even bowel and bladder issues are not why they're coming in. It's a really good point. I've actually had several colleagues who've walked down the hallway like drunken sailors and did not realize that. And I always find it amazing how patients' families laugh when their, their loved ones kind of wobble around during my physical exam part and find it amusing. And uh, uh, it's, it's really amazing how this is missed. I want to just thank Dennis Velez. He again identified we should document cervicogenic headaches. They're hard to pick up. Uh, there are International Headache Society criteria, so thank you, Dennis, for that, that we can help to use to differentiate headaches. And um, again, then um, the other big misdiagnosis, uh, and this is Rakesh Kumar who said that, is neuropathy. A lot of people run around with neuropathy diagnoses, and it's actually not neuropathy. <laughs> Uh, one of the subtle signs that often gets missed is patients come in for, for something, you know, they may have, you know, carpal tunnel or whatever. And if, if you look at, they will have atrophy of their um, first torsal introtia. And that usually is a, a, a lot of times um, sign of cervical myelopathy that gets missed. Um, and, and like you said, a lot of sometimes patients, these, because these signs appear so subtle, and uh, the usual population that we deal with is older. They sometimes don't notice that it's anything unusual. They attribute it to, part, to aging process. All right. Um, I think we're a little short on time. Let's let's go to the next article. Is that Mike? Yours? Uh, this is your. There we go. Can you, everybody hear me now? I think we're probably good. Uh, so uh, I'm going to discuss an article uh, out of Europe, actually. It's this uh, article here. That was a re retrospective uh, registry-based observational study uh, using a Norwegian database uh, looking at degenerative cervical myelopathy. And this is really just looking at, um, primarily looking at outcomes after decompressive surgery. Uh, so this particular population, like I said, is a retrospective data of a study using Norwegian registry for spine surgery, which is also known as NORSPINE. And this is a registry in Norway that um, they have for quality control and research purposes. Uh, there are eight centers apparently performing surgical spine surgery, cervical spine surgery, excuse me, in Norway. Uh, and 81% of patients who undergo surgery in the cervical spine in Norway are included in this database. And the authors actually make a point that this is 81% uh, of all patients uh, undergoing surgery in the cervical spine. That includes uh, trauma and that sort of thing. And they actually think that uh, probably the number or the percentage of patients undergoing surgery for degenerative cervical spine conditions is probably uh, actually higher than 81% that's included in this database. Uh, so this looked at patients between 2012 and 2018. Um, there was no real control. This is all retrospective. So the surgical approach, the number of levels, uh, use of instrumentation, type of instrumentation, this is all at the surgeon's discretion. There's not really any control for that. <clears throat> the primary outcome that they're looking at was the change in the neck disability index and between the baseline and then uh, the one year follow up. And then they also looked at a number of secondary outcomes, um, which included the EMS, uh, the Euro uh, European Quality of Life score, uh, the new and then the NRS for headache, uh, neck pain, and arm pain. I thought that was interesting that they included neck headache as one of their uh, secondary outcomes, but I thought that, that was actually really useful. Uh, they also included perioperative complications in the immediate uh, operative period. Uh, and then they also included patient reported post op complications uh, that happened within uh, three months of the operation. Uh, so they screened uh, just under 6,000 um, total patients uh, and they excluded those that were operated for surgical radiculopathy. Uh, they only included the patients that, in, that were operated on frigid degenerative cervical myelopathy, which turned out to be 905 patients. Um, slight, uh, slight majority uh, underwent anterior sur uh, surgery for this, with about 40% of patients undergoing posterior, uh, very few patients undergoing uh, front backs in their study. So in terms of their uh, total, um, you know, they, they obviously generated a, a lot of data for this. They were looking at a lot of different outcomes here. Um, so the NDI, the neck disability index, was, again, their primary outcome. 
Um, but as you can see from this table, uh, all these different measures that they looked at for both mild and moderate to severe myelopathy, uh, they saw significant uh, changes between baseline and one year. Uh, and these were all statistically significant in their studies. They also included a mixed linear model analysis, which basically was just patients that they were missing some of the data for follow-up. So they had these patients follow up. Uh, they had the, their baseline, and then they had three months and then one year. Uh, so some of their patients were missing some of their data, and so they uh, used the mixed linear model analysis to um, kind of control for that. And so this is a little bit, the, the ends in, in this table are a bit higher, but it shows the same thing. Uh, that all these patients had significant improvement in virtually all of the uh, objective measurements as well as uh, the patient reported uh, outcomes as well. <clears throat> these were, uh, they, uh, one of the questions that they asked the patients were, was their overall perceived benefit of the operation? And they included this both at three months and 12 months. Um, and uh, most of the uh, patients were either um, uh, most of the patients were either slightly much or complete, uh, much better or with a complete recovery um, with about 40% saying that either they're much better or completely recovered uh, at three months. Um, that number was slightly higher at, uh, at one year is up to about 45%. Um, with some patients, uh, with, with a higher percentage of patients at one year saying that they were actually a bit worse off. They didn't really go into uh, the details about what these patients meant by you know why they were much worse or you know, if it was because of their neck pain has gotten worse, they have re recurrent symptoms or whatever, they didn't really go into that. Um, but you kind of see both uh, at both ends, uh, slightly higher percentages. So uh, at one year, a little bit, uh, slightly higher percentage of the patients were either much better or totally recovered, but also a slightly higher percentage were uh, either worse, um, much worse or worse than ever. So these, this was their table in terms of their um, surgical treatment. So we already talked about um, slight majority of them underwent anterior uh, versus posterior um, uh, decompressive uh, operations. Very few of them uh, got instrumented fusions, which I thought was uh, a little bit interesting. I, I suspect that if you did a similar study in the United States, that uh, slightly higher increase, uh, higher percentage of these patients would be undergoing instrumented fusion among the posterior um, posterior group. Um, the majority of these levels, or the majority of these patients uh, had stenosis at C4-5, C5-6, uh, which is really not surprising. And I thought that their overall rate of complications was uh, relatively reasonable. I really didn't see anything that uh, really stuck out to me too much. Um, their complications within three months, uh, at first, you know, 27% complication rate is, seems extremely high, but when you look at, uh, you know, kind of what those complications were, um, there was uh, a, quite a, quite a variability in these. You know, you, everything from a UTI, which um, you know may not even be um, that, that might not even be tracked in in some of the studies that we look at in the United States. Um, but also, they had some more significant complications like new onset arm and leg weakness. Uh, that again, they don't really go into any detail about that. <laughs> again, this was really just a, a very much an observational retrospective study, so it's not clear to me. Um, you know, how weak uh, they actually were if these patients were, you know, waking up paralyzed versus, you know, some transient, um, you know, C5 palsy, for example, or something like that. So the mean uh, NDI score based on 35.1, uh, one year follow-up was 25.1, uh, and that was, again, statistically significant. Uh, and that was true both in the mild uh, myelopathy as well as in the moderate to severe myelopathy uh, with a you know bigger difference in the moderate to severe uh, versus the mild. Mild went from 32.2 to 22.7. Moderate to severe went from 48.7 uh, to 34.9. Uh, the mean change of the NDI exceeded the minimally uh, clinically uh, important difference of six uh, 7.5 points. And that was true for both the mild and the moderate to severe. So uh, in conclusion of this study, in terms of discussion about it, uh, in, in their particular uh, uh, database in this Norwegian study, it was associated with significant and clinically relevant improvements uh, across the entire range of patient-reported outcomes for both mild and uh, moderate to severe. Uh, and these were favorable both, again, in the mild to moderate severe with, with a bigger effect observed uh, in the more disabled group, which uh, is relatively unsurprising. Um, and obviously more research is necessary to determine the optimal surgical strategy for um, cervical myelopathy. This really didn't delve into that question really um, at all in terms of timing, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, anterior versus posterior, how many levels, you know, there's, there's a 
infinity of questions that uh, we still have. But at least in this study, they found that uh, for both mild and moderate to severe, they, these patients were uh, benefited by, by surgery. So that's all I got. I don't take any questions. Uh, yeah, so I think um, this, is, this is also an interesting article. So there, there is, uh, you know, it does show that there are some regional differences in, uh, um, you know, number, first of all, treatment strategies. Uh, it is a retrospective uh, um, registry, and uh, I think apparently in uh, Norway, just like a lot of other European countries, there's always a database maintained. Um, so what we're looking at is a sort of a, a cross-sectional uh, view or review of their retrospective database um, and, uh, and uh, trying to evaluate uh, 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 history or natural history of a treated uh, cervical myelopathy. Uh, so... Um, this is basically just a historic report of what's been done there. And uh, um, it, it does show that patients have, uh, uh, you know, the, from the patient reported outcomes, they have improvement uh, in their uh, uh, pre-treatment um, um, symptomatology. Uh, you know, from the level of evidence uh, and, and, you know, it's, uh, overall strength of the paper, uh, you know, apart from that uh, information, it doesn't add a whole lot. Um, um, you know, they lump uh, mild myelopathy, moderate and to severe myelopathy all together in the same uh, uh, discussion. Um, uh, and it's kind of hard to tease that out. Uh, they also didn't really differentiate uh, between the surgical strategies and uh, uh, treatment, uh, surg uh, surgical treatment um, outcomes uh, um, separately because the study obviously is not powered for that. It's a retrospective review. Um, uh, so I think, you know, it, it gives us some useful information about how different uh, um, uh, social, socioeconomic and geographic um, implications of treatment of cervical myelopathy are um, in different regions. We can uh, certainly um, uh, identify with those. Um, there is information about perioperative uh, complications, uh, uh, which are not, not, not frequent. They're, so it's a uh, overall, a pretty safe treatment strategy. Um, but once again, we don't actually, actually, this paper doesn't actually elaborate anything about what would be the optimal treatment strategy or or any such things because of the you know, you know nature of the, the paper. It's a retrospective cross-sectional review. Yeah, I, I think you, I think you pointed out really nicely the limitation limitations of registry data. And if you think of registry data, if you think of like a lake, it's a big lake, but it's very shallow. So you catch a huge swath of population, but you can really only answer questions very limited, one or two questions. Patients improve, will improve compared to what, or how much do they improve? And really what, what, what you can get from this, at least in say Norway, for example, is kind of benchmarking data. So say that, uh, of the eight centers, a ninth center for spine surgery wanted to open up in Norway and their reoperation rate or neurologic deterioration rate was way different than this overall broad registry data. It provides a good benchmarking for a society, but like you said, it doesn't really answer questions on approach and you know, in and deep oppressions that like a randomized study, but randomized study of less patients, this has tons of data, but just not not very uh, the lake's just not very deep in terms of the questions you can answer. But I think you pointed that out. Farhan, uh, are there any advanced uh, techniques to determine the integrity of the cord? For example, with the diffusion MRI scan, I know you're using this with concussions. I've seen a little bit of data in the uh, to evaluate the spinal cord, but part of the problem is we do these operations and you know the results are modest. Even in the first paper, the NERC went from two down to one. I mean, it's not a dramatic result. And we do the operations and we tell the patients, well, we're going to rest where you are and hopefully you're going to get better. It would be really nice if we had more definitive uh, information about the cord itself. So is there anything new on the horizon that can help us with some predictive analysis? Well, unfortunately, I think, uh, you know, the, several things have been discussed and talked about uh, diffusion for cervical spine, uh, you know, uh, seemingly a great idea, but doesn't really pan out because the MRI doesn't capture that very well in the cervical spine. Um, so it, I, I, I don't think that there's any objective information available that can help us um, identify, differentiate, um, because part of the problem is that there is, a, you know, when there is cervical stenosis, there is so much... Uh, 
artifact and the space is so small, that it's hard to, uh, for, for the best MRI capabilities, it's hard to uh, evaluate that. Now we do have uh, uh, several centers, including our center that has a seven Tesla MRI and it's not been looked at um, from that perspective. I think that would be something that we need to look at and uh, maybe that seven Tesla MRI, you may be able to differentiate minor um, myelopathic changes that sometimes um, are, are missed on uh, uh, standard um, uh, three Tesla or 1.5 Tesla MRIs. Um, so that's all I can say, but uh, certainly uh, some area for growth and uh, uh, improvement in uh, technology. Thanks. All right, uh, let's go to uh, the third article. And Dr. Ortiz uh, is presenting that one. This is probably one of the more most interesting ones out of these that uh, I wanted to uh, leave for the last. I think we'll have some time for good discussion on this. All right, let's see. And uh, can you see that okay? Yes. All right, so uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having us. I'm, I'm Mike Ortiz. I'm a PAY SITS resident uh, here at the University of Missouri. And uh, our last article is uh, going to be uh, this clinical trial uh, published in JAMA, uh, titled Effects of uh, Ventral versus Dorsal Spine Surgery on Patient Reported Physical Functioning uh, in Patients with Cervical Spondylotic Myelopathy. And this is actually a very, very interesting uh, prospective uh, randomized clinical trial out of uh, uh, multiple centers in the nation and really with a phenomenal group of uh, spine surgeons. So the objective of the paper was to uh, determine if uh, ventral uh, surgical approaches uh, uh, were better compared to the, a dorsal cervical approach for the treatment of uh, spondylotic uh, cervical myelopathy. And the measure that they use to determine uh, uh, the, uh, the effect of surgery was uh, patient reported physical functioning at one year. And they specifically used the short form uh, 36 uh, PCS uh, score uh, to measure that. Um, uh, it was a randomized clinical trial. Uh, the patients uh, were aged 45 to 80 years. They have to have two signs of cervical myelopathy and uh, at least one segment of uh, uh, significant uh, cervical stenosis on imaging. Uh, they were enrolled uh, across 15 uh, North American hospitals from April 1st, uh, 2014 to March 30th, uh, 2018 and their final follow-up was in uh, 2020. Um, patients uh, were included, again, by age, uh, symptomatology and radiographic findings of uh, cervical stenosis, and they were excluded if they had OPLL uh, significant cervical kyphosis, which was measured on more than five degrees, uh, measured from C2 to uh, C7. And uh, they were also uh, excluded based on on, on, on a panel review that, we, that we'll shortly uh, discuss. So once the patients have been included into the study, they went into a review where uh, 15 spine surgeons uh, will look at the images and they have a standard, standard set of uh, radiographs and MRI slices that they looked at. And then uh, these people voted on whether or not this patient was suitable for randomization. And if the patient was suitable for randomization, then they voted on what approach they would favor. And if, uh, if a majority of the panelists uh, said that the patient was not suitable for randomization, uh, then the patient would be excluded. And if more than 80% of the panel selected a particular approach, then the patient would be uh, assigned to that approach and they, they would be out of the, uh, out of the trial. So uh, six on, uh, sorry, 163 patients uh, were randomized 63 had ventral surgery and 100 had dorsal surgery. And it's important to note that dorsal, dorsal surgery included uh, uh, laminectomy and fusion and also uh, laminoplasty, which I think is the, the, the most interesting point uh, out of this paper. Uh, ventral surgery uh, was um, either uh, ACDF or uh, a one-level corpectomy was also um, 
allowed. And then so dorsal surgery, uh, laminoplasty, uh, open door laminoplasty and uh, laminectomy infusion. Um, so their primary outcome, which was a change in SF30 sits, uh, did not show a significant difference between ventral and dorsal uh, approaches. Uh, it did reach the minimum uh, clinically important difference, which was uh, defined as five. Uh, so both groups, dorsal and ventral, got better after surgery, but there wasn't a, a significant difference between the two. And this was measured at one year. And then they had other secondary outcomes, which are mentioned here in the slide, which were uh, modified JOA score, uh, complication rate, uh, their work status. Uh, and they, they uh, looked at work status at one month, three months, six, and, uh, and uh, 12 months. Uh, changes in sagittal uh, vertical axis, uh, amount of health resource utilization, and then one and two year uh, NDI and Eurocall uh, scores. And uh, out of those seven secondary measures, they, they only found a difference in, in one of the measures, which was um, uh, complication rate. And we'll look into that uh, here in a minute. So uh, both groups were uh, very comparable. I think uh, the randomization uh, actually was, was very suitable uh, for analysis. They, um, they uh, had uh, 66 on the ventral fusion group, 69 on the dorsal fusion group, and 28 in an aminoplasty group. And they actually randomized patients on a two to three basis to account for uh, the amount of patients that could be potentially lost to a laminoplasty procedure. Um, like uh, I briefly mentioned, uh, patients who have ventral surgery improved uh, 5.9 points uh, in their SF36 score at one year. Uh, patients in dorsal, dorsal surgery improved uh, 6.2 points, so they reached their minimally uh, clinically important difference, uh, but there were no significant differences between the two uh, groups. And out of the pre-specified secondary outcomes, only one showed a significant uh, difference, and that was actually uh, rate of dysphagia, which was... Uh, 41% in the ventral surgery group versus zero on the uh, on the dorsal uh, surgery group. I, I thought that was a little bit interesting that nobody had swallowing difficulties in the posterior groups. And sometimes we can see that from intubation and other sorts of things. Uh, uh, but it, it, it really makes sense that if people were having one high one level ACDFs or corpectomies, we would see a higher rate of dysphagia uh, in that group. And that was the only uh, um, difference that they saw in secondary outcomes. Now, uh, they, they disaggregated uh, the dorsal surgery group and, and separated them into those that had laminectomy and fusion and those that had laminoplasty. And I think this is where the, the, the important, interesting findings of the study come from. It's actually from the, the secondary non-randomized analysis. And what they found is that the laminoplasty group was associated with better SF36 scores than the dorsal group at one year and better scores that both dorsal and ventral uh, uh, fusion groups at two years. Uh, the laminoplasty uh, group was also associated with less health resource utilization, and that was measured as uh, less rate of diagnostic testing, uh, less uh, opioid use, and less ongoing physical therapy on follow-up. Um, <clears throat> I think the limitations uh, of the study is that um, Probably at this point, even though we don't have a lot of uh, prospective uh, randomized clinical trials on anterior versus posterior fusion for uh, uh, cervical spondylotic myelopathy, I think we do have enough uh, base evidence to conclude that in most scenarios where both approaches have clinical equipoise, they're pretty, uh, they're pretty similar. And, and I think you could go both ways and make a reasonable argument to support one over the other. But I think laminoplasty, uh, even though it treats the same pathology, needs to be considered a completely different uh, procedure. And that has to do with, with the biases related to uh, the, the population that gets treated by laminoplastics and also, and also the biomechanics of the procedure. So I think uh, 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 limitations of this uh, paper include that there was no randomization to the laminoplasty procedure and not all the surgeons involved in the study uh, actually perform laminoplasty. And I think particularly with a procedure like this where we've been having uh, emerging evidence that, that that this is a useful procedure, one might have a bias that if you are able to do a laminoplasty, uh, you want to offer it and you want to see how patients do. And that selection bias uh, uh, is real. And also uh, in most cases, uh, great um, 
great patients for the for laminoplasty would have other pathologies, like for example, a congenitally narrowed canal, uh, which we don't necessarily uh, would want to offer an ACDF for. Um, so there's a bias there. And I think that sometimes, um, sometimes when a patient has cervical spondylotic myelopathy and they have significant morbidities, one might think like this patient would benefit from, from a laminectomy infusion, but uh, they might not tolerate surgery that well. And I think a, a good in between sometimes would be like, we don't really want to not do anything, but laminectomy infusion might be too much. And you may want to offer a laminoplasty for, for that group that is kind of a quote unquote sicker to, to have a fusion. And I think those, those are all important limitations, but really interesting findings. And uh, finally, uh, uh, they concluded that uh, in, in a group of patients with cervical spondylotic myelopathy undergoing cervical spine surgery, uh, a ventral surgical approach was, was not superior or did not show any significantly uh, significant differences in SF, SF36 improvements at one year uh, compared to the uh, dorsal surgical group. And uh, that's all I have. Okay. Uh, and so uh, let's see how much time we have. Yeah. So let's do a, a quick uh, critical uh, uh, appraisal of this. Um, article. So uh, it's a randomized clinical trial, of course, we, that's, you know, the best form of evidence that we uh, um, typically look for. And unfortunately, in the world of spine surgery or neurosurgery, there aren't a lot of those. We've got some very big names in uh, uh, spine surgery um, involved in this paper. Um, and uh, the overall design of the paper is actually pretty good. Uh, however, there are cer certain big major inherent flaws that you already alluded to. Uh, and I'll just go a, a little bit of brief detail into that. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, their inclusion exclusion criteria are great. Um, I think uh, that uh, really uh, does bring about equipoise in uh, uh, those particular patients. They are looking for patients with uh, two or more level disease. Um, um, so I think, you know, anything less than two level um, disease, we obviously have a different uh, mindset of thinking process um, when it comes to more than two level disease, uh, then there's um, that question of equipoise. Um, then they had a very uh, elaborate um, uh, process of evaluation by all the 15 uh, primary investigator uh, groups um, to evaluate and each and every uh, patient, their radiographic uh, images, and then assign um, a score and based on that, um, identify whether they were eligible for uh, randomization or not. And if they're 80% of the panel thought that uh, one approach were, was better than the other, then they would not be eligible for randomization. So I think that's pretty um, um, strong and that does allow um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, correct or uh, assignment of the patient more robust. Uh, the, the biggest flaw again, like you mentioned, was that uh, uh, laminoplasty was lumped into the same um, uh, procedure group, and then the assignment of a randomization was based on was uh, was based on that. So the procedure group um, uh, were obviously uh, is a is a bigger group, and the interior group is a smaller group um, uh, based on that. And uh, the biggest problem in that is that uh, there were some centers that are not that were not comfortable doing uh, uh, laminoplasty, and uh, they do mention that. Um, and then there were some centers, prefer preferably, uh, were choosing to do posterior uh, uh, laminectomy and fusion. So uh, I think that brings about a, a big question in the scientific uh, process of this uh, uh, paper, because uh, now you're uh, uh, making your randomization procedure uh, power to um, uh, capabilities of individual center. And uh, that makes uh, things a little bit more challenging. Nonetheless, I think we have what we have. I don't, I mean, this is, I, I wish that this, it was a little bit cleaner uh, from that perspective, but it's not. Um, uh, so we have this information um, now available in, in terms of randomization. The most remarkable outcome to me um, from this was that, uh, you know, the a significant proportion of their patients had dysphagia from uh, anterior um, approaches, uh, which we all know that more than two level um, uh, anterior cervical uh, um, surgery patients have dysphagia. How much of that was um, um, uh, self-limiting or, or, or had a, a more meaningful long-term outcome? That part is not evaluated in this uh, um, article. Uh, patients in posterior surgery, of course, if you look at from that perspective, appear to be um, somewhat, if, you know, if, if there are two treatments that are uh, equal in outcome, 
uh, then obviously uh, most patients would um, um, agree or most physicians would agree to choose um, the, a treatment strategy that has less um, complications, uh, whether they are short-term complications or long-term. Um, so I think uh, uh, you know those are important points um, um, to uh, uh, consider. Uh, at the end, they have gone on to uh, uh, differentiate um, laminoplasty from uh, in a non-randomized fashion um, analysis uh, from other treatment strategies, and have gone on to say that perhaps laminoplasty is a better treatment outcome. I don't think that this paper was powered for that or um, has uh, enough authority to say that because laminoplasty itself was not randomized and compared. But it does uh, it does show that. The the patient outcomes were somewhat better. So I think what, what it tells me is that, okay, we have a, an, a, another treatment option um, available for patients with more than uh, two level disease. Uh, we still have to figure, uh, we, we still haven't answered which one of those patients, um, when you compare laminoplasty with the posterior uh, decompression and fusion, which ones are more eligible for laminoplasty. Uh, for example, um, how much of uh, uh, kyphosis, how much of uh, um, so the severity of uh, uh, degenerative disease uh, is acceptable from lam laminoplasty uh, versus fusion perspective. So I think th all of those questions are still uh, present and valid. Um, and the paper quality, the design of the study is obviously very good, but certainly could have been better. Uh, I think Scott has a comment, but just quickly, this is a phenomenal study. Zoha Gogavala deserves a lot of credit. One thing was the decision making of anterior versus posterior. And when I recognized Dr. Harshad Parekh from Mumbai for his question, was that a physician panel was asked for their preponderance of recommendations. That's never been done like that before. I thought that was ingenious um, because it shows the differences of our opinions, experiences, et cetera, and it shows how much discrepancy there is. But if there was a preponderance of recommendations for one thing, that was chosen. The second big insight for me was uh, how we underreport complications. Uh, the uh, shocking number of dysphagia patients is very much in keeping in the ballpark with Edwards' um, uh, paper 20 years ago that said 30% of patients have dysphagia. It's not dysphagia, it's dysphagia. So this is a really big deal. We need to be more transparent about that. The other thing was the pain of posterior fusion patients. But when you look at the details, and we've had Zohar out here several times, um, the, the devil in the detail is that in posterior fusions, there was a iatrogenic kyphosis preponderance that was pretty shocking. And this is, I think, just surgical technique or a lack of surgical technique where patients are fused into a flexed position due to positioning intraoperatively and a lack of attention to restoring true lordosis. So I think these are some nuggets for the final one. And this is where I, I look for Dr. Ziegler's face because we have this argument many times. I do think that laminoplasty is a fantastic surgery that is way overlooked. And if all things are equal and there are no major contraindications, I personally prefer laminoplasties over posterior fusion. I just don't see the patients perfectly for that. With this, I'll shut up. Uh, maybe I'll pass off to Scott and then I uh, look forward to the University of Missouri's comments. Um, actually, I have a question. And um, so, and maybe I missed this in the in the study design. It's I mean it's thought of at least in most centers. The more levels, the more appropriate the patient is for posterior surgery. So was was there a preponderance? I mean, when when a patient got to four levels, did they still randomize them to anterior and posterior? Because a lot of people at that point would pretty much just indicate for posterior. Whereas two levels, okay, two maybe three most people would feel comfortable kind of go, you know, being randomized, or at least as a, as a surgeon, I'd feel comfortable randomizing a patient. Um, did, did, was the study biased that way, that, that uh, you know, four-level anterior cervical patients and older folks do have a lot of, oh, and thank you for teaching me this uh, dysphagia, not dysphagia. Um, was there a bias that way or not, or how'd they account for that, that bias of, of the more than three-level or more than two-level uh, disease. So the, the number of mean stenotic levels was 2.8 um, in both groups, and it was the same. Uh, so I think they 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 uh, pretty much very uh, uh, balanced uh, and equally assigned those patients to each group. Um, but overall, I think uh, I, I'm not sure if they actually differentiated between a three and a four level and dysphagia 
preponderance. Did they, Mike? Did I miss that? Do you? No, I don't. I don't think that's clearly I specified. Think... And, and I think uh, I uh, I think we agree with Dr. Blumenthal's uh, thought. And I think probably what uh, took those patients out of the randomization is that if eighty percent of the panel uh, favored one approach, then that patient would not be randomized. So I think that's probably the fail safe uh, in, in that setting. But that, that's just assuming. And, and yeah. I know that I would disappoint Jens if I didn't show off our TBI bias that for two level disease, maybe three, without significant kyphosis and no OPLL, that perhaps a group could be arthroplasty also um, in the anterior group. Well, it, it, it depends. But I think what, what, what we've learned from these papers are, and while this was a paper where they submitted all the patients to panel, it really depends on the surgeon's experience. If somebody has vast experience with laminoplasty, there are ways of doing it and doing it really, really well, which I happen to agree with Jens. We are pro-laminoplasty here or motion preservation. But if you're not comfortable doing it, then you might feel more comfortable with the posterior decompression infusion, or you might feel more comfortable with the anterior. And I think, you know, none of these papers have clearly said that one uh, approach is better than the other. So it really comes down to the surgeon preference. Wouldn't an interesting study be, you know, rather than anterior versus posterior surgery for two or three level myelopathy? would be motion preservation, either anteriorly or posteriorly versus fusion anteriorly or posteriorly. That would be a nice uh, study. Well, it certainly would be an interesting study, Scott, because if you look at the very first paper, you know, while the patients had functional improvements, uh, really their objective signs, according to the surgeon's evaluation of their neuric status, really didn't improve all that much. So the question is, do you have to get total decompression? The concern about arthroplasty, in other words, can you take away enough bone to decompress the cord? So it would be interesting. And I was going to use your quote about this last paper. It was it was like a lake that was very shallow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very interesting. So I yeah, I think uh, I mean I all of those points are very uh, valid and interesting. And I think there is certainly more in, with, with the uh, motion preservation and more emphasis now on motion preservation surgery. Um, uh, you know, there's certainly room for more studies uh, uh, involving that particular aspect. Um, I think, um, you know, one of one of the things that I will comment on in my, you know, my training and in my practice also, and I would just have to address the, the elephant in the room is that uh, most of the uh, people in unfortunate uh, in unfortunately in our um, health economics uh, stature uh, have evolved or tend to choose uh, posterior cervical fusion versus um, laminoplasty because of the obvious uh, financial um, implications. Um, I know I've heard that uh, um, comment several times in our training. And I've, I know that in my um, um, uh, tenure also, I've used that comment several times. So I think we, as physicians, need to scientifically evaluate uh, the true differences between fusion and motion preservation and really identify which patients are um, eligible for that and use that for the sake of patient long-term outcome. Because I think the long-term outcomes are what, what, what guides this whole process, um, you know, motion preservation versus fusion. Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting topic that we've talked about forever. And now we have uh, great internal fixation techniques, both anteriorly and posteriorly. You know, we can have a hybrid technique where you do a couple levels anterior, do a laminoplasty posterior. So unfortunately, there's a lot of different ways of skinning the cat. Jens, where are you? Right here. Thank you. Sorry, I was uh, distracted a bit. So this is such an important topic. I really want to reiterate our gratitude towards our neurosurgery colleagues at the University of Missouri. I want to point out we have a University of Missouri orthopedic candidate here today, Dr. Zhu. So we're excited to have her here. Um, but there's so much to learn still. And again, this really uh, broaches the, the boundaries of um, uh, what do we do with preventative surgery? Uh, how can we more, be more sophisticated in terms of picking up myelopathy? But for the most important thing is we, I think, as surgeons, as spine surgeons, should advocate for better recognition of myelopathy and understand the various subtleties and disseminate that amongst practitioners. This is not to pad our own surgical schedules 
but we can, I think, do a really important public service to uh, make sure that in our medical schools and with our trainees and with our colleagues in other specialties, the recognition of myelopathy is a significant and growing due to our aging population, social, uh, 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 economic situation uh, is a real threat, a health problem that has been overlooked. So you've raised that awareness greatly with your talks today. And although there are many unanswered questions, I think all of us can, can go out of there with a better armamentarium of uh, knowledge. With this. Listen, I, I want to welcome uh, Mizu here. I think it was great to welcome into part of the SSF family. So uh, thank you for a great presentation, Farhan, and all your uh, fellows and residents. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This really was a very good learning experience. It always is. Everybody. <laughs> Happy and healthy new year. Take care. Thank, thank you. you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you.